friends, Caleb here in the Rosa String Works Workshop with another edition of Shop Talk. Um, I suppose we ought to get the elephant out of the room first. We've had some big changes in the shop. Uh, effective today, Jerry has fully retired. He's left me entirely in charge. So there's going to be some big changes coming up soon. Uh, I'd like to run through a few of them with you before, you know, you're shocked by them. Uh, first off, we're no longer going to be working on mandolins or violins or guitars. From now on, the only thing we'll be working on is accordions. I just think this shop is a little more suited for that sort of work. Another big change is no more bluegrass music. We won't be doing it. From now on, it will be atonal or jazz. That's it. Another big thing for you to remember is the date. Today is a big day because it is April 1st, April Fools. <laughs> All right, we've had our fun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I said to him, I said, okay, what good are you if you can't come up with a good April Fool's trick? And he says, well, what if we did that? So I said, perfect. <laughs> perfect. So good job, Caleb. Good job. Now, how many of you needed to go change your underwear? <laughs> or take a heart pill? Uh, no, we're not ready to quite do that yet. <laughs> but who knows? It might happen. Anything could happen. I do think we have a pretty good shop talk for you today, and we're going to get into it right now. So I'll tell you the list of things we're going to talk about today, and the very first thing, though, is just, hey, we passed another milestone. We went past 61,500 subscribers. <laughs> That's a milestone. Other people celebrate, you know, 50,000, 60,000. I celebrate 61,500. So, cool. Welcome if you're new. Some of the other things we're going to talk about are um, why I cut out the rose petals uh, and why I don't let the laser cutter do more of it for me. We're going to talk about uh, salt. We're going to talk about uh, some of my humidity supporters and a couple of things they talked about. We're going to talk about uh, a little bit of uh, the non-instrument videos, just very briefly. And I'm going to mention a few other things about things in some of those videos. So I've got just a few topics here. The first thing is related to the guitars and the peg heads. And I just happen to have one right here. Believe it or not, the California guitar is back in the shop here. And if give you a close-up look at that rose, and I have to turn it sideways, I'm sorry, because the camera's not able to accept it in a different position here the way I am right now. But if you look closely at those petals, and I don't know if it's focusing there, you can see that the grain orientation in each petal is going a different way. So the question came up in the video was, why don't I just etch those lines in there and just cut out a single big rose and drop it in the hole, be much easier. Well, that's true, it would. Uh, you know, obviously I've thought of that. <laughs> the problem with doing that is it looks real plain. What, so what I do is I exploded all of the petals in the software, pull, pulled them all apart, then I turn like each petal a different direction. So then when the laser cutter cuts them out, all of the grain is going in different directions. When you put it back together, all of those grains run together and it looks much more natural. It looks much more like a real live flower. You know, it would be really simple, really quick to just let the laser cutter go in there and etch it all and stick it in there. It'd be one fourth the time, less than that probably. But it just doesn't look as good. So that's why I do it the way I do it. And then the next comment about that was, why don't I just take a piece of tape, stick it down on there, and, and move it over to the hole and drop it down in there, you know? Yeah, well, that's the reason. Because it isn't, it isn't cut out in the shape of the rose. It's cut out in individual petals. And then you have to piecemeal put them back in there. 
and when they flip over on you, you can't tell which ones are flipped and which ones aren't. So it's kind of like working a jigsaw puzzle that has two sides to it. Anyway, it does make it look much, much better when you do it that way, rather than just etching it. Now, I do etch the design in a couple of little pieces, uh, just because they're so tiny that I, and that's why it only takes it a second to do the etching that I, that I do, but then I, it takes it a little while longer to cut them all out. And therefore, I think that addresses the questions that came up on that. There were a lot of questions on that and uh, why I was doing it the hard way. Well, it's not doing it so much the hard way. It's doing it the right way or the better way or the prettier way. The next question that comes up all the time, every single time I glue two flat things together and they start sliding around, and I put the two little pins in there to lock them in place. Why don't I use salt? Well, I don't use salt mostly because I just don't use salt. I don't have a good, I mean, I've known about the salt thing for years. I just don't think it's a good idea to mix salt with your glue and uh, to get salt on anything. Uh, salt is incredibly, uh, I don't know, just corrosive, but corrosive is the uh, is the problem with salt, and and I don't see any reason in introducing that into a pure woodworking project, and especially a high end pure woodworking project. Uh, I watched Matthias Wandel one day go off on a rant on salt, and he does not use it either, and he will not use it, and I'm kind of the same way. I I know there's just as many of you will comment on this video, I use salt and I've been using it for years and I've never had a problem. And I say, I got no problem with that. I'm perfectly fine with you using salt. I'm not telling you not to do it. I'm just saying I don't do it, period. That's just that simple. In the last shop talk, I went off a little bit on a rant again about the humidity thing. And perhaps it was about, it was about the Gibson guitars specifically, why they split so much and uh, why the sides don't go back to fit the shape of the back and all that. Well, one person said they, um, they used to humidify their instruments and the braces kept coming loose and uh, all kinds of problems. And that will probably happen more on an older instrument with hide glue because it softens the hide glue. But then again, everything causes hide glue to turn loose. It doesn't matter whether it's too much humidity or too little humidity, hide glue turns loose. But anyway, he said he was, uh, you know, humidifying instruments and he had to ship his guitar back to Martin a couple of times. Once he quit humidifying it, those braces quit coming loose. Now, I'm not saying there's a direct correlation, but you can draw your own conclusions. It's just simply the fact that wood is a sponge and it loves to suck up moisture. And when it expands, it wood expands very easily with moisture and it just causes your finish to crack. That's why I say, why do that? Because I guarantee you, you're putting more moisture in there than the day the instrument was built. <sighs> Regarding the ongoing saga with arthritis, I wasn't even gonna talk about that today, but you know, I just wanna say it this way. It's bad, it ain't getting a whole lot better. I've been back to the doctors again. They run more tests and doing more things and we're gonna probably put me on some stronger drugs. I told them I'm not interested in taking any of those crazy drugs that cause stroke and heart attack and kidney failure and all these other things. I said, I've already got arthritis, I'll just stick with that. So they, they do think there's another drug that I can go on that has proven pretty safe and has very, very few side effects. So we're gonna look at that down the road here. They're in the process of getting that approved. You know how you have to get everything approved these days. But pl the reason I even brought the arthritis up today was I would, I'm just, asking you as nicely as I can. And I don't want this to sound ignorant, mean, or anything. Please just don't send me any more remedies or cures or fixes for arthritis. I have tried dozens, dozens, and dozens, and I am burnt out on it. I'm not gonna try anymore. I'm over it, and I'm accepting whatever fate comes uh, at this point. That doesn't mean I'm giving up exactly. It just means I'm not willing to try any more, you know, remedies or fixes. Uh, I'm gonna let the doctors 
figure it out if they can and if not then I'll just deal with it as it comes. They are checking me for the uric acid levels and they've done a bunch more x-rays and, and so forth and they do think it's more of a rheumatoid type arthritis now. They were talking osteo at the beginning but now they're really thinking it's much more like rheumatoid. Personally, I think it's both, and the reason I say that is because my dad had osteo, my mother had rheumatoid, and they both had very severe cases. So, there you go. That's enough said about that. I didn't even want to bring that up today, but I just, the reason I brought it up was to ask you, please just don't bother sending me anymore, because I'm not really going to read about them or do any more on it. I'm over it. So many people, and I just want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. We're very, very, very supportive on the non-instrument videos that I show from time to time. As I mentioned in my about section on my main page, it says that I will do that. I, you know, I, it's from the day one it said that, that I will introduce other kinds of videos occasionally. And there has been a few more recently than normally but that's because I just got behind on so many projects and I need to get caught up on them and there will be some more of those coming so I hope you enjoy them if you don't like those then don't look at them that's the best I can help you with that some of the comments about that were uh, you know and I thought it was a very nice comment and it's kind of the way I feel about it it was that uh, they felt like it was just friends showing friends what they're doing and that's kind of the way I feel about it I'm you know I'm just showing you what I'm doing you know if you want to see it great if you don't that's fine you don't have to watch it then the, there was a number of questions about the Bobcat cylinders and they were saying uh, do they work? Now that I fixed them, I didn't show them working. Well, the reason is I only fixed the first one. I didn't show the second one being fixed. But the second one was actually in far worse shape. I didn't show that, but it was in far worse shape. And the inside of the uh, cylinder was uh, scarred, uh, had lines down it. So I even honed it. I took a regular cylinder hone like you would use on a, on a car engine and I honed the cylinder, uh, cross-hatched it, cleaned that out, put, put it back in there. And both of them seem to be working fine. They're really working fine and you will be seeing some more Bobcat videos coming up fairly shortly. And the backhoe, uh, the way I modified the backhoe and the attachment and everything, the way that fits on there, that thing, it works as way better than I ever thought it would work. In fact, it works so much better on this big Bobcat than it did on the previous two Bobcats that why they don't make it for this Bobcat, I don't know, because it's much more powerful, moves it much faster. Uh, it's just like a real backhoe now, uh, just with a shorter reach. It, only, it can only dig, I think, nine feet deep, something like that, but shoot, how often do you need to dig that deep? I don't remember ever digging nine feet deep four feet deep, you know, something like that. I dig quite often. So anyway, all of that is good. It all works perfectly. A couple of folks wanted to see how I sharpen my lawnmower blades after watching the chisel sharpening and the plane blade sharpening. And uh, because I mentioned that that lawnmower blade thing is how I got acquainted with <laughs> grinders. So I'm gonna give you a little demonstration on that. I think it could be helpful for you. Uh, I'm gonna, probably tell you a little more than you wanted to know about lawnmower blades. This is a new blade, of course, uh, that would fit my wife's lawn tractor. And I say my wife's because she won't let me touch it. <laughs> she loves to cut grass. That's why I married her. <laughs> anyway, it's got, you know, it's got the beveled edge here. Now, really, honestly, I don't think I can rub my hand on that hard enough to cut myself. I mean, it's this is fr fresh from the factory and most people would just put this on and start cutting and it would do a decent job. I'm not gonna say it wouldn't. But her uh, lawnmower or tractor is different in a couple of respects. It was a, a Great Dane. I guess you would say it was an entrepreneur type lawn tractor. The guy started a business and called him Great Dane. Uh, John Deere bought it out, and then I think they just closed it down, basically, I think, but I'm not sure. But anyway, uh, John Deere owns it now, apparently. What I started to tell you about it is that the reason it's different is that these blades spin at such a high rate. They spin so fast. Now, keep in mind, you're talking about somebody who grew up with 
you know, in a lawn service business that had lots of lawn tractors, lawn mowers, etc., and so forth. I have never seen blades spin as fast as these blades spin on this Great Dane. And when you turn them on, it does sound kind of like an airplane or a helicopter. I mean, it's going, <laughs> it just goes crazy. I mean, they are just spinning so fast. Now, the re I think there's a reason that they spin so fast is that this particular lawn tractor also drives forward really fast. It's almost like a four-wheeler. I mean, this thing hauls. And because it hauls so fast, the blades have to spin fast to keep up. Okay, all that to tell you that that's what a new blade looks like, and this is after like one season of use. I mean, they just wear down the ends, and this is not even a bad one, trust me, uh, especially if she hits a lot of rocks. And you can see how the edge is all chewed up there, perhaps. Try to get it to focus. Maybe see the edge better from this side. See how it's all, it's rounded over. I mean, it's, you couldn't cut yourself with that if you fell on it. I mean, it's not sharp at all now. So we have to sharpen these blades quite often. I order them like a dozen at a time because with all the rocks here for one thing, and we've gone through set after set, I couldn't even tell you how many. I know that my dad in his professional lawn service didn't go through as many blades as we go through on this tractor. I wouldn't necessarily recommend this tractor. It's just, it's kind of cool in a couple of ways. Like I said, it was kind of an entrepreneurial deal and we bought into it and I don't know why we did, but we did. My wife mainly bought into it. She really liked it, so I bought it for her. All that to tell you that we're going to try to sharpen this. These are a lot harder to sharpen than most. For one thing, they got a real long cutting edge. Now, that real long cutting edge, by the way, is a kind of a farce on almost all uh, lawnmower blades because if you look right here, it's still relatively sharp right here. So this much of it's barely getting any use at all. It's just the tip of the blade that really does the cutting. And that's just pretty much the truth on all lawnmower blades. Think about it, the blade's spinning and as you're going forward, what's cutting? The tip. So the tip is where all the action is. Somebody might wanna know why these are turned up and especially turned up even more so than maybe on some lawn mowers. These are really turned up pretty, pretty much. That's a lifting action that it creates like a suction or a fan, kind of like a, a propeller or kind of like a, a airplane wing and it lifts. So this lifts the grass and then of course the blade cuts it off smoothly. Now, another couple of things that you may or may not know about lawnmower blades. If you're at all particular, you probably want to balance them. Um, it's kind of important to balance them, especially like on a push mower. Uh, because it's this is your flywheel essentially or it's very much like a flywheel you get this thing spinning at a high rate of speed and um, if it's not balanced in other words if it's heavier on this side man it can throw everything out and it can burn up your bearings it, you know it can it can just create all kinds of problems on tractors especially I think it's important now my dad never did bother with balancing on a tractor he balanced them on the push mowers for sure but on the tractors, he didn't bother with it, and maybe he was right because he never really had any problem with spindles burning out. But on this high-speed tractor that's spinning so fast, I want these babies balanced, and I'll show you how we balance it after we sharpen it. So here goes nothing. Okay, the first thing is, to be honest with you, I would prefer to sharpen these on the uh, rougher stone, but because they're cut the way they are, it's much easier to sharpen them over here and drag across. You can't sharpen here because the motor kind of gets in the way. It's just awkward. So, you know, if they were sharpened on the other edge, you could pull and go that way. Or I could switch the wheels, which is just too much work, especially for this demonstration. So I'm going to use the finer grit and um, I'm going to sharpen it, but I would prefer to be using the heavier grit. I'm gonna go ahead and sharpen this full length, but the truth of it is, if I sharpen really from here down, I would be plenty good. Uh, it would be fine. Uh, but, but and, and by the way, this is kind of rounding around, and I basically just follow that because if you tried to grind all of this back to make a straight, perfect straight edge, you'd just be wasting your blade. So here we go. Safety glasses. the very first 
cut there, you can see that it's pretty much one facet all the way across. Now that's because I had it sitting on this rest. If you don't have a rest, then you brace it against your body like this and you run it across the wheel. Now, my dad never had a rest, so I learned to do it this way and I can do it just as accurately this way as I can with this rest. The rest just makes it easier. The real secret to, to getting down to a good edge is to watch the sparks coming over the edge. And when they start just trickling over the edge, you're good. This one's going to take a while because this edge is really bad. edge is so bad, I'm going to concentrate on the end more. Okay, I, I have a few facets in here, but one continuous facet from here down. Now, this is not done yet. The problem is, this is so worn and it's still so round that I'll never get to a sharp edge. Now, ordinarily you don't do a lot of sharpening on the back of a lawnmower blade. You just kind of run it across there. But because of the excessive wear on these kinds of blades on this particular tractor, it's kind of necessary to do a little bit of back grinding. And I don't normally recommend that. I'm just doing it because I have to with these blades and this particular lawnmower. Okay, you can see the sharp facet there, and it's pretty much just one facet, especially from here down. So, a little bit of crud up here, but from here down, it's just pretty much one pure facet. One perfect grinding mark all the way down. And it's really pretty close, but if you look at the edge, you can still see it's kind of dull, shiny, if you will. I don't know, that sounds kind of oxymoron, but it's kind of a, a dull shine here on this edge. And you can tell that it's not razor sharp. Up here, it's pretty sharp. But down here where it was so rounded off, it's still not, the two edges still have not come together perfectly. So I'm going to work on that a little bit more, maybe even off camera, and then I'm going to show you the final pass where you're watching these sparks come over. Okay, I'm pretty close to that last pass here, so I'm going to show you. Now pay attention to the amount of spark coming over the edge. You want to try to keep that spark even the whole way. Like if you see sparks here and then you don't see sparks and then you see sparks, well then you've got a problem. It's not going to be a perfect edge. Okay, that's 
that's a pretty good edge. It's not perfect. It's not a perfect one facet either, by the way. I was moving a little bit there. But it's the edge was so chewed up, you know, it's really hard to get a perfect grind on a blade this bad. On a, on a new blade like that other new blade, it's pretty easy, actually. Um, okay, but there's, there's the new blade, or the new sharp edge, and then you can compare it to the old edge. You know, I mean, like, I, did, I actually ran that one through by mistake accidentally one time there, but, but you can see there's really nothing there. I mean, you couldn't even cut yourself on that if you wanted to. This side, on the other hand, would pretty much slice your finger pretty good. Now, there's going to be some people say, well, that real skinny edge is why it goes dull so easy. Yeah, that's true, obviously. But, on the other hand, have you looked at your grass and see the brown tops? Now, you're talking about, this is coming from somebody who's colorblind and can't see that anyway. But, you'll, whenever your grass is turning brown on top, that's because your blade is dull. If you have a really sharp blade, it will cut through and your grass will stay perfectly green on the top. Your grass will actually grow better and, and, be, and be better producing looking lawn if your blade is really sharp. Off camera, I'm going to go ahead and sharpen this side here and then I'm going to show you how we balance this. Okay, I have one of these little cone blade balancers here, and if you want to know where to get one of these, you, most of your box stores carry these in the lawnmower section, wherever, you know, like if you're talking, you know, like a hardware box store, uh, wherever they sell lawnmower blades, they generally have these, and they're inexpensive. So you, the hole, this, these rings will fit the hole here, uh, and you just have to kind of set it on there, and if it doesn't fit the hole, you just kind of have to get it sort of centered there as much as you can and you can see that this side is heavier than this side so this side is going down so I need to grind a little bit more off of this side I'm gonna do that off camera and I'll bring it back and we'll see if we can get it to balance okay so this is the side I ground because this was the heavy side so let's see if it's still heavy Still just a teeny bit heavy. I took a pass and a half off of this, so I'm going to take about one more good pass and, and concentrate on the end the most because the end, of course, is where the most weight would be, uh, you know, to, would affect the balance the most. So anyway, I'm going to take another pass on this side here and see if it's still heavy. I took another pass and a half off of this heavy side. Let's see if it's still heavy. It's just the teeniest bit heavy, but it's really close to level now. So I think I'm going to try one more little pass, light pass, and it should be just about perfect. Okay, I took actually two half passes, and uh, you know that's because this end needed cleaning up anyway. And this will either be just right or maybe a little bit too much. Boy, that's perfect. I mean, like, it's perfect. It just sets there perfectly. It doesn't go up or down. And another way you can kind of test it is to spin it. I spin it backwards to see if it does anything crazy, you know. Pretty flat, pretty flat. So that blade is really balanced. It won't give you any trouble if you put that on your spindle, even under these super high speed blades. And I mean seriously telling you these are high speed. So I hope you enjoyed that little uh, segment on everything you wanted to know about a lawnmower blade and then some. Hope that helps you. Also, uh, so many of you are following along on the 12 string build and I thought I'd give you a quick glance at it. It's in the finishing stages. We're getting some finish on it. We're using the True Oil varnish, and it's going really well, but the finishing stage is the slowest part, and so the videos are gonna be fewer and farther between on this till we get her finished up. I just wanted to kinda let you know what the status is on that so that you uh, can uh, rest easy and not wonder why we aren't putting out more videos on it. That's the status. Well, for the tip section of the shop talk today I went through thousands and I mean literally thousands of comments trying to find a subject that I could do a tip on this morning or today I should say and just couldn't really come up with anything I feel like I've covered everything 
just about there is, and uh, one one video or another. So I decided to talk about things that I, tools and jigs and things that I use in the shop that mostly that I've made or modified. So let's just pick one and start. Let's start with this one. This, as you can see, is just a C-clamp, and in this case, it is a Craftsman 4-inch C-clamp. I just took a piece of flat steel, welded it right along here, and uh, you could braze it along there if you didn't have a welder, but you had a torch. You know, and that's all I had at first was this skinny thing, but that was kind of awkward a lot of times and sometimes I needed to put it in the vise a different direction like this only let me put it in the vise this way but if I once I put this square block on there then I could turn it in the vise in, in any of the directions real easy you know and so that that was helpful to have that square end on there so you could just use a square tube rather than this flat bar to weld to your uh, clamp if you wanted to Anyway, so what's the purpose of this? Well, uh, mostly I built it for holding mandolin necks. Uh, when I'm working on the mandolin or, or like, especially you could put, put the mandolin neck in here, clamp this down on the flat top of the neck, and then you could do the binding on the body would be one example. But there's other reasons you work on instruments too that you need them held. And this is and so I lined this with uh, leather. This is just a piece of pipe that I, uh, you know, cut half and two. It's just a piece of pipe. And then I put leather in there. And it works really well. It's just welded in there again. And I didn't really have to modify the clamp itself other than just to add this piece of pipe and to add the handle onto it. Really is all that amounts to. Then I got to thinking, well, you know, it would be nice if this thing could handle more than just mandolins. So I made this little uh, thing here that fits in there just nice and snug and then I can put guitar necks in here now too. So it's really handy for that too and you can clamp it securely in your vise and then hold the guitar by the neck here. So very cheap easy way to do this. They make very expensive things similar to this that you can buy but uh, this is a very cheap and easy dirty way to do it. Hope that gives you some idea. Along those very same lines I needed one that was a little bit more flexible yet. So I did basically the same thing. I took another four inch clamp. In this case, it's not a Craftsman. It's, this is just a uh, cheap one from Harbor Freight. I cut the clamp off in this case, welded it to this deal here, the square block, put another piece of pipe there as you can see, and then basically did exactly the same thing. The difference here is that I mounted it to this round thing and there's another, uh, you know, this round pipe and there's another round pipe inside. So really when you take it apart, all it is is a piece of pipe welded there and then another piece of pipe. And I went ahead and put an end on it just so that it can only slide into that end. You know, it didn't have to have that, but it was kind of nice. And then I just put a threads in here and screw in here and I can, I can lock this in the vise and then I can turn the guitar, you know, in different angles and stuff like that. Or you can lock it in the vise this way and, you know, you can have the guitar vertical if you want to. You know, I mean, there's, it, this is really, really, really flexible. You can do a lot with this. I even use this in the vise here on my desk and set it in, in, you know, in different ways. Um, you know, I can lay it like this and hold the neck right here at my desk. So it's really handy. This is a very, very, very handy outfit. Again, it's just two pieces of pipe that happen to kind of work together. You know, they're, they're, they, they fit pretty, pretty good. Um, again, you can put adapters in there. Uh, there there's leather in there for uh, the necks. And then you can make other adapters to, uh, to, like if you want to turn the neck upside down in this, you can do that too. So I made this little adapter for that. You can set this in here. Now that now you can take the guitar and put the put the uh, flat down and uh, clamp the back side with this. And of course, you need to put leather in there if you do that, just to keep it from marring it up. But anyway, it, it's very very flexible, cheap to make. Just takes a little while if you've got a welder and you know, uh, especially if you got some way to cut the steel, like you know, a, a grinder, a cutoff wheel or something. 
Um, it doesn't take very long to make something like that. So those two little jigs there are very handy. I think you'll like those. One of my other original creations is this little deal. <laughs> People are always seeing this and, what is that? Where'd you get that? This is just coat hanger wire. It depends on the size of guitars you're working on. Sometimes you need a couple of different sizes of these. But basically, this just hooks over the end pin, like so. This comes up over the end of the guitar. You've seen it many times. And then there's just a hook on both sides where I can hook both E strings of the guitar. And um, I can run it up to the, to the tuning keys. And then I can float the bridge or the saddle or both and, and float them and move them around and tune it and check intonation. Um, this is just really a handy way. Now you could just use a regular guitar uh, tail piece that hooks to the back of the guitar too and modify that. I mean, you, you, there's an any infinite number of ways you can do this and I know some of you have done that. Um, I also made this one and I was trying to make one that was a little more high quality than this, I guess you'd say. And I put a slot in here and then you can put a screw in um, at different heights depending on where your end pin is. And uh, I just cut two little slots in there to grab the strings. Um, this was just some aluminum extrusions I had laying around. But you know, there's just an infinite number of ways to skin every cat, you know. And so that's just a couple of ways there. And we do use those quite often here in the shop. Another thing that we do all the time is take things apart. Fretboards, you know, uh, tops off, backs off, that kind of thing. So you gotta have tools that fit into slots. Well, I've shown this a million times. Um, I haven't talked about what it is exactly that often, but this is, I believe this is an old uh, artist palette knife. I'm pretty sure I bought it new, but I bought it new 40 years ago or 35 years ago. And um, anyway, I ground the bottom edge of it off here so that you can get down flatter, as you can see. And then I shortened it up. It was quite a bit longer and I shortened it for the stiffness. And of course it's gotten shorter over the years as I've sharpened it and sharpened it and sharpened it. But anyway, uh, you want a blade that's really thin, but yet really stiff too. Not one that's too terribly flexible. Uh, if it's real flexible, you'll bend it. Case in point, here's another out, uh, artist palette knife. And this is one of the really flimsy ones. Look how that bends. That's not a whole lot of good for really, when you have to get in there really hard and press. But you can heat this one up really good and slide it into a thin crack. So it's still valuable. It's just not as good for really forcing something apart. Like this one's much better for when you gotta use a little bit of force. This one here's better when you just have a real fine crack and maybe you just need some heat back in there to melt the glue or something. Um, so I use different things like that. I also make them, um, this is I think a putty knife blade that I just reshaped and it's, it, uh, the putty knife blades are really good. They're very strong, they're thin and they're flexible. So they've got everything going for them. And, um, and then I just put this on a walnut handle and I just cut a slot in the handle there you can see and put one rivet down through. And uh, you know, that, again, I, I got that flat bottom going on there where you can get in low. Um, so that's just a putty knife. And here's another putty knife that I left the handle, the regular handle on it, and I just ground the tar out of it, you know. And uh, it's pretty handy, and it's real thin, and it's real flexible. But again, on anything that flexible, if you're pushing really hard, you'll fold it up and bend it. This one, you can tell, has had that happen to it a bunch of times. It's folded and bent through there a bunch of times, and I've straightened it out. But so those are some good tips on tools that you can make cheap uh, to pry things apart. All right, I got a, two or three more little items here that uh, I just saw laying right here in the shop. I made this, uh, and I've only used this a few times, but if you really want to get super detailed on your setup, this is really good for measuring your string height at your first fret. 
it's not that great anywhere else, to be perfectly honest with you. This, this can straddle your first fret here, and uh, then you put your string under here, um, and what you do is you let this sit on there, and you, and you read it, and then you press your string down, and it'll tell you how far your string went down, and that's then you know how high your string is. So this is pretty good, but to be perfectly honest with you, it's a little bit of overkill. Uh, they sell these, of course, at high dollar. I just made my own just to see what it was like. And it's pretty good. It really does work pretty well. It's just a little bit more than you need. Um, you can do the same thing with just a real thin pick and you slide it under there. And when, this, when the thin pick just barely goes in there without lifting the string too much, well, then you're just about perfect because that's about 18 thousandths of an inch. And uh, that's pretty close. I mean, you can, you know, and, and even with the pick, you can get all kinds of different measurements with one pick um, just by using your common sense. You know what I'm saying? Um, for instance, uh, I'll take my 18 thousandths pick here. This is a real thin 18 thousandths pick. And like on the big E string, I'll slide this in and I want it, you know, basically loose, but it just touches the string, you know. Then the next string, maybe it touches a little bit more, and the next string a little bit more, and then you get down to the final E string, and it's actually lifting the string just a little tiny bit. Well, obviously you've set, you know, a, a slight action there. You've, you know, you've gone from high down to thinner and thinner and thinner just with one pick. And it's just common sense, you know. It's and this is crazy fast. I mean, you can't hardly do it any faster than with this. Um, and if you, you know, if you pay attention to how you're cutting it and don't go too fast and check it often, a pick works great. I use the purple pick on the mandolins at the 10th fret, 12th fret, anywhere up in there. And the purple pick is around on 45, 46,000, somewhere in there. And if you can hold, you know, if you can hold this at the, from anywhere from the 7th fret on back a little bit, uh, and you can still hold this and play with that buzzing, your action's pretty dang low. 40 thousandths is, you know, 45 thousandths is pretty low. So you're doing good. Again, just common sense type stuff. Uh, here's another deal where I used another one of those um, uh, indicators. These are called indicators, by the way. They measure in thousands of inches. And um, you can buy them cheap off of eBay, whatever. I mean, you can get them for 12, 15 bucks a piece. And most of them work pretty well. Uh, you know, you kind of get what you pay for. You should look at the ratings and all those kinds of things. They also make these that measure in 10 thousandths of an inch. And that's a little bit much for the, our purposes on setting up instruments. One thousandth of an inch is plenty good. Um, you can see how I made this. Now they sell these things for anywhere from, I think, maybe the cheapest around 80 bucks. I, I think they're more than that now to about 180 bucks. I mean, they're, they're, these really are pricey. So I just made my own. I just got a piece of aluminum here. This is about, oh, roughly half inch thick aluminum. Uh, cut out this area here and, uh, you know, attached. Uh, you know, I had to cut a slot in it up here to uh, accommodate a bolt going through the holder for this indicator. And then I just made this little lifter deal. It's, uh, it's not the best, but it works. You know, it's just a rocker deal here. It's got a little slot cut in it, if you can see. And then a little fork made deal that just hooks on the little lifting deal right here. <laughs> I don't even know what all these things are called. But anyway, you lift that right up and uh, you can see how it changes there, it changes the dial. And uh, it, you know, as I mentioned, it reads in thousands of inches. So just as an example to prove what I was saying, here's that 12 or 18 thousandths pick. Uh, is it set on zero? You can change this dial here on the front. Um, that is if I can loosen it up. Wow, it's tight. Okay, there we go. All right, the dial's pretty much on zero there. Although these things are sensitive, you kind of had to adjust them and readjust them and that kind of thing. All right, so this should probably read to your deal there about 18 thousandths. I'm gonna look and see. Reads right at 19 thousandths at the moment. 
you know. So, I mean, these are very accurate uh, indicators and things. Anyway, this is for use for measuring the thickness of a top or a back or anything. And it can be on a guitar or it can be on a mandolin or whatever, violin, whatever. So this is a very in, indispensable tool. I also made an adjustment here where I can, you know, help get it to the, uh, to the zero. So this can screw up and down too. Um, I rounded that, the head of that bolt off so that they kind of meet in a point. You know, it's just, again, simple common sense stuff. I, two little uh, screws that go into the bottom of the aluminum here. You do have to learn about, you know, drilling holes and threading holes and things to make stuff like this. But it is perfectly doable and you can do it a lot cheaper. Uh, you know, I'm not saying I don't have some money in this. That piece of aluminum probably cost 20, 30 bucks because it's not cheap. And this indicator probably cost 20 bucks. So for 40 or 50 bucks, I made this thing, possibly less, if you have, especially if you have some of the material laying around. But that's a lot better than at least twice that price if you go buy it. So there you go, that's a, a real handy tool. We use that quite often. And then this tool here, um, you know, if you work on violin bows, you're gonna have this tool already probably, but if you don't work on them and, and you need to work on one, well, you probably want something like this. Um, this has got foam rubber padding in here, and uh, you can see how you can tighten this up here on the edge, and then you, you put the, t the tip of the violin goes up here, and you can leave the hair sticking out and uh, the frog goes back here and again you can adjust and then it of course is adjustable this way too for the different lengths of bows and um, anyway you can this little extra thing here I, I it's just a little I put a little screw on a deal here and what I can do is I can drill a hole into something if something's hard to pull out like the little wedge or something I can drill a hole in the wedge screw this in and pull it out so this is, that's all that's for when I'm working on bows. But I make all kinds of tools and things. But uh, anyway, that's what that is. It's not much to it, but if you work on violin bows, you need something like this. I'm sure I got, this is not my original idea. Many of, many of these other things are, but this is not my original idea here. I'm uh, sure I saw this in a book and uh, made it from a book. And here's the final tool I made. And when you need this tool, and I don't need it very often, but when you need this tool, you really need this tool. It's handy. Boy, it is so handy when you need it. And you look at it and you go, what the heck is that? Um, it's got a hole through here. And you can see it's, I used an old violin tuning key because they're good for nothing in my opinion. Anyway, it, it works. This rotates if you spin it, you know, this, this little deal here spins. There's a hole in there. Obviously, you still put a wire through there. And then this hole down through here goes through a tiny hole in a guitar top or mandolin top or whatever. You can put a button on the end of there and a, a, or a washer or whatever, and you can go through your brace and uh, lift. You can take this and lift that brace on the inside of the guitar and uh, you know, uh, glue it and all that whole bit, and then this, and then crank it up tight, and this will absolutely crank it tight. Trust me. Or you know, any other number of things where you need to lift something inside the guitar. Or say you have a sagged spot in your guitar, and you're trying to lift that little sagged spot. You can use this to lift it. You know, put again. You'd have to put something on the inside of the guitar to drill a tiny hole, just big enough to get your wire through, and. Uh, put a plate or uh, a call or anything on the inside and it, maybe you want to lift it up and uh, then you just do this and you can just lift it. Boy, I mean, you don't need this very often, but when you need it, this thing is flat awesome. You can make this out of wood. I made it out of a piece of uh, uh, plastic uh, rod, uh, basically is all it is, but you can make this out of wood. It wouldn't have to be plastic or anything. Um, very simple, really, but super handy when you need it. That's going to do it for today. Those are your tips for today on how to make some of your tools and things. If you have uh, questions and things that you think might be of interest to a wide audience, be sure to put those in the comments, and I'll use those for food for thought for the next Shop Talk.
Thank you so much for watching. Y'all have a great day. April Fools. Thank you.